Good morning. Good morning here in the loft, and good morning, Zoomers, and good morning, those of you at the Admiral. I'm Rob Muller, a member of the 2U Board of Trustees, and my pronouns are he and his. We're really pleased that you're here with us in the, in the um, loft this morning. So today, we're in person at the Admiral at the Lake, in person here, and continuing to meet on Zoom. And we really appreciate your indulgence as we work through the complexities of a three uh, three location service. We're glad you're here, whichever way you choose to join us. Um, following public health guidelines, we've moved to, as you know, making masks optional in the sanctuary. We remain committed to creating a safe experience. Uh, and if COVID numbers or other public health uh, reasons require it, we'll begin asking that folks mask again. We know this isn't the preferred solution for everyone. Um, so please do mask if you're more comfortable doing so. And if we don't have masks available, uh, we certainly should um, should make sure that they, they are. Um, we especially welcome newcomers and visitors this morning. Finding a new, a new community and making new friends and connections can be challenging. So know that we're excited to have you here and look forward to getting to know you. Um, if you'd like to so note in the chat or in the uh, conversations after the service, please do so. You can take a blue mug to signal to others that you'd like um, like them to come up and say hello. You can even use a blue mug if you're not new and you'd like someone to come up and uh, say hello. Some of us do that because we find that sometimes easier. Our worship today is led by Reverend Karen Mooney and Sue Dunmore along with John Broom as worship associate. Music is provided by our presenters and by Shobun Walker. Our time together requires a large group of people who make possible our worship music and technical production of our services. They're listed in the order of service, and we thank them for their ongoing service to our congregation. You can find additional announcements in your order of service. And thanks for your patience while we uh, hold services here in the loft. You may be curious about construction. It is proceeding on schedule really well, and we should be back in the sanctuary by mid-September, at which time the second phase of the construction project and the elevator and all that and, and ramps begin, which is gonna take some time, but we do hope to be back downstairs by mid-September. Uh, so with that, I welcome John Broom to the lead our call to service. Good morning, all. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a community of children, youth, and adults a people of many beliefs and traditions bound not by the specific list of things that we believe, but by the values that we share. So whether you're joining us for the first time or the thousandth time, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, all of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. Whatever your race, whomever you love, whichever way you move in the world, however much money is in your pocket, you're welcome here. So I invite you, when you feel ready, take a breath in and out. And as the music begins, let, her, let us enter into our service together. Thank you. 
In a moment, Marion and Harris at the Admiral will light our chalices, the symbol of our faith. We light our chalices this morning with these words. We honor those identifying and identified as female, the women in our lives. We honor the lessons they have taught us through their actions and inactions, words and silences, their passions and their love. Please stand in body or spirit to sing hymn number 1003, Where Do We Come From? The words are in the teal hymnal or on your screen. So this song is around, and what I'm going to suggest is that there are four different parts to it, but you can stick with the, with the melody if you'd like, or you can venture off into the wild beyond, however you, <laughs> however you feel so called today. Simone on the, on the piano is going to play the, the melody. Why don't you sing that with me for a couple of times, and then I'm going to go off into the other parts. If there's a part that you particularly like, please just stick with it. So, here we go. invite you to stand again. <laughs> Sorry, that's how we do things. And join me in reciting our covenant. The words will appear on the screen momentarily. There they are. We covenant to build a community that challenges us to grow and empowers us to honor the truth within ourselves. We will be generous with our gifts and honest in our communication holy faithful to a love that embraces both diversity and conflict. Called by our living tradition, we will nurture spirituality within a vision of the eternal, living out our inner convictions through struggles for justice and acts of compassion. Please remain standing. 
strengthening seeming spirit of life, number 123 in the Great Hymn Multitude, Latin F for the words of our prayers. Now safe to take your kids. This is our story for all ages. Once upon a time, there was a farmer whose horse ran away. The neighbors came in the evening and they were commiserating with him. We're so sorry to hear that your horse has run away. This is most unfortunate. The farmer said, maybe. Well, the next day, the horse came back, and he brought seven more horses with him. And in the evening, everybody came around, and they said, Oh, isn't that lucky? What a great turn of events. You now have eight horses. And the farmer said, Maybe. <sighs> the following day, his, the farmer's son tried to break one of the horses that had come back. And while riding it, he got thrown and he broke his leg. And the neighbors, they said, oh dear, that's too bad. And the farmer said, maybe. Well, the next day, the conscription officers came to conscript people into the army. And they rejected the son because, you know, he had a broken leg. And again, the neighbors all came around and they said, isn't that great? And the farmer said, maybe. <laughs> the whole process of nature is an integrated process of immense complexity. And it's really impossible to tell that whether anything that happens is good or bad, because you never know what the consequences of a misfortune will be or the consequences of good fortune will be. So the kids, yeah, Go ahead. the kids are staying with us. <laughs> uh, invitation to giving. Each year, we all make a commitment to support the ministry of our church. In addition to this contribution, each Sunday we take a collection so that we can sh that we can share with those doing justice beyond our church community. While we are unable to all come together in person, you still can share your resources. To make your contribution, you can go to our website or you can send a text to the number on screen. For the month of July, we are sharing our plate with the Chicago Furniture Bank. This morning, we will have some words from Brett Kobe. Hello, everybody. My name is Brett Kuby. I am the vice president at the Chicago Furniture Bank, a nonprofit right here in Chicago. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for inviting us into your service today. Um, at our nonprofit, uh, our mission is that we fully furnish the homes for free of anybody and everybody who's exiting poverty and homelessness here in Chicago uh, and getting into subsidized housing. Those units are typically unfurnished, 
And so that's why they uh, rely on us to, to do that. Uh, in fact, the city has recently tapped us to begin furnishing the homes of the 11,000 asylum seekers who were recently relocated here to Chicago. So as you can guess, we have a really big need for uh, all the support we can get with everything that we are uh, taking on our shoulders. We furnish 25 homes per day. That is a lot of furniture that it takes to keep the operation going. Um, and I thought that I would share just a quick testimonial to you uh, about the type of people that we help here. Of course, we help people who uh, maybe are exiting incarceration or people who have struggled with substance abuse and are uh, getting out of homelessness now because of that. Uh, but one story I'd love to share is uh, about someone named Kathy. Uh, she was actually a, a victim of domestic violence and was forced out of her home. She had to go and live in a shelter uh, with her kids to try to rebuild her life. Um, using the nonprofit support here available in Chicago, she was able to get into that uh, subsidized housing, but oh no, the unit was entirely empty. So at Chicago Furniture Bank, we for free were able to fully furnish her home, uh, provide beds and furniture for her children so that she now has a stable foundation that she can continue uh, rebuilding her life uh, from. There are a couple great ways you can support us here. Thank you so much to the church for offering to uh, share some of today's collection plate with us. Uh, but on top of that, like I was saying, we are always in need of uh, furniture. So if anyone is looking to uh, donate any pieces, is moving, is doing some summer cleaning, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, also, the way that we generate the vast majority of our revenue is we actually have our own junk collection service called Honest Junk. And so if anyone would like to reach out through the church, please do not hesitate we're doing a lot of great work here uh, in the city for those that we serve. And again, we are, we are so grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Our offertory words will be on the screen and I invite you to join me. They really will. Please join me. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm it and enable its participation in the larger world around us. The collection will now be generously given and gratefully received.
I invite you now into a spirit of prayer and meditation. Let us start by taking a deep breath together. Breathe in and breathe out. We begin in thanks. Thankful for the breath in our lungs, the beauty of our earth, and the strength of this community. We hold in our hearts those who care for family in ill health, those who live with grief or chronic pain, those struggling with addictions or illnesses, seen and unseen. We are with you. For parents and teachers, and those whose primary spiritual practice is caring for children. We are with you. We pray for our neighbors in prison, for those who are struggling to stay afloat amidst poverty. We are with you. We pray for those living in harm's way. We pray for our planet and commit to work that will lead us away from the harms of climate change. We pray that wisdom, compassion, and empathy guide the leaders of our world. May they and we be instruments of a just and lasting peace. Our lives are blessed by those who knowingly, with curiosity and courage, face their final days. Into this shared silence, I invite you now to speak the name of anyone you wish to lift up in the loving support of this community. With our deepest compassion, let us hold in our hearts those named and unnamed, those remembered and those forgotten. Let it be so. Amen and blessed be. Full of lighting can during our ritual of lighting candles for our joys and concerns, we want to continue to maintain our safety with each other. In the 2U loft, you are invited to come forward and light a candle. As you end your time of contemplation and candle lighting, we invite you to use the hand sanitizer available. For those at the Admiral, I invite you to come forward and take a pebble from one bowl, putting it tight, hold it tightly, putting your energy into that stone, and then knowing your joys and sorrows to be shared by the community, let it go lightly into the other bowl. For those of us on Zoom, Please join by sharing your joys and concerns in our chat window. And I will light two, we will light two candles here, one representing our unspoken joys and another for our unspoken sorrows. Thank you. 
We hold, we hold all these joys, celebrations, sorrows and struggles close to our hearts. Reverend Karen, would you share the first reading, please? Our first reading this morning is a gem that you may have heard before called Success by Bessie Stanley, often attributed to uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I guess if you're gonna get attributed to somebody, that's as good as it might get. Um, they have achieved success, who lived well, laughed often, and loved much, who gained the respect of intelligent people and the love of little children, who filled their niche and accomplished their task, who have left the world better than they found it, whether by an improved poppy, a perfect poem, or a rescued soul, who has never lacked appreciation of the earth's beauty or failed to express it, who has always looked for the best in others, who has always given their best, whose life was an inspiration, whose memory a benediction. Our second reading is from Philosophy Now, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. In it, the author Uvo Noah Harari offers a history of humanity and a theory for why Homo sapiens ultimately survived when other species did not. He argues that the real advantage to our mental superiority was our capacity for imagination. This imaginative capability allowed Homo sapiens to create and spread myths, which opened the door for large scale cooperation. We were able to form larger communities based on our commonly accepted fictions. In summarizing his position, Harari writes, any large scale human cooperation whether a modern state, a medieval church, an ancient city, or an archaic tribe is rooted in the common myths that exist only in people's collective imagination. Churches are rooted in common religious myths. States are rooted in common national myths. Judicial systems are rooted in common legal myths. Yet none of these things exist, exist outside the stories that people invent and tell one another. There are no gods in the universe, no nations, no money, no human rights, no laws, and no justice outside the common imagination of human beings. So what are the stories you've gathered? Which stories keep you company or make sense of the world that you inhabit? Which stories literally make you up? First Nations theologian Thomas King warns, you have to be careful with the stories you tell because stories are all that we are. I've spent much of my life living into stories that I claimed or that were given to me without checking them very much to make sure that they were true or indeed in my best interest. In recent years, however, I've begun to look more critically at the stories which make up my life. I am someone who wants to be authentic. And if I am going to be authentic to my deepest self, I need to know who that actually is. My name is Karen Mooney. My family's version of Mooney came to America from Ireland before the Revolutionary War. It hails from the center of the Irish countryside where the green hills yield grain and wool. Derived from one of the oldest names in Ireland, Monarch. My lived understanding of this name, however, resides in our family crest. Oh, God help us, we have a family crest. <laughs> The family crest is a lizard in a tree. I do not lie to you. Now, 
A tree in Ireland is not the first place that I would go looking for a lizard, okay? But neither would I expect to see the slightly nerdy, tube stock, street shoe wearing, cross country biker people that make up my hyper intellectual family. And yet, this is who we are. In my imagination, my ancestors got to the whole, we're gonna pick a symbol for your family thing a little late, all the lions and crowns and money, suits of armor were all gone, and what was left? A lizard in the tree. So I remember our unconventional crest when I do something utterly odd, which is hopefully often, I am my people. I'm Karen Mooney, daughter of Janet and Terry, sister of Suzanne with an S, thank you very much, and Larry, granddaughter to Babs and Ralph, Johnny and Gardner, great granddaughter of Maud, Sarah, Mudsy, and Letitia. I'm descended from people whose names I no longer even know or remember, but whose tintype pictures show up when rifling through boxes I inherited from my folks. I come from women, strong, quiet, opinionated, obstinate, cranky, and compassionate. Women who handed down curious, discerning, and even suspicious ways of seeing the world. Women who taught me to be fierce, to stand my ground. Women who passed along stories of strength and curiosity and hopes, I think, that I live into the fullnesses that they could never even imagine. One story goes that my great-grandmother, Sarah, shouted out of a second-story window to her son, Ralph, stand still, and proceeded to shoot the rattlesnake that was at his foot. A Mooney, but raised a Bradford. She contained the complexities of being descended from explorers and, I'm going to put this in air quotes, pioneers claiming to find a new world. Hmm. Like most folks, my story is complicated. William Bradford was the captain of the Mayflower. So my ancestry dates back to a time when those European white folk violently colonialized this land, pushing out First Nations people in order to claim their own religious freedom. You see, Puritans told this story, a divinely inspired story, I should hold up my hand, a divinely inspired story of a city on a hill which enshrined dominion over all others, allowing their comfort and their freedoms to take precedence. My family stories bring conflicted feelings and I suspect I'm not alone in this. If you've dug, your history may include stories like mine, but they may also include brilliant creativity sitting next to addiction, achievement next to marginal choices Every person that I have ever known well is flawed. No one's story is perfect. Sarah Bradford Mooney's story is not one that I bring up at liberal progressive gatherings. Still, it is my story, my history. I remember Sarah and honor the tenacity and courage mixed with luck or skill, not sure which, that could be life-saving. I remember Ralph who listened and obeyed. Imagine that. I remember Captain William Bradford, whose bold arrogance saved one group of people even while their presence initi initiated the a near annihilation of another. The lessons I gather from these stories today, the things that cloak me in the who-ness of who I am, don't be arrogant in your ignorance. Be curious about the world. Be compassionate, wondering, and still skeptical about what I think I know. It's not easy. The stories I choose to tell also tell something about me. But we all remember that news, right? Just like, hold on for it. 
the white woman in New York Central Park who was so uncomfortable with being corrected that she, for walking her dog in a bird sanctuary, that she called the police and reported that a black man was threatening her. Bird watcher Christian Cooper had told the woman she was not supposed to walk her dog there. He may have been annoyed, may have used a tone in his voice. He may have even stepped towards her as he spoke. The woman's response was to call the police. I imagine that some part of her brain knew if I scream loudly enough, this person, their concerns will magically disappear. She knew in her bones that for hundreds of years, white women in this country have been protected from anything a black man does, no matter who was right, who was wrong, no matter the intent, no matter real or fiction. For hundreds of years, people of color have played an incredibly high price for white comfort. Wow. Oh, that was horrible, I thought. And then I read this Karen. It was the first time I had heard the word Karen, my name, used as a verse, as a code word for women who weaponize their white privilege. Once you hear it, though, it's, you see it everywhere, right? I began hearing it again and again, a Karen in Montana that during the pandemic coughed on a couple, a Karen in California who called the police a neighbor stenciling Black Lives Matter on their own property a Karen in Pennsylvania who attacked white staff because she wasn't being seated. Wow, can they do that to a particular name? My response was not really that comfortable. It was not complicated. I, I, no one wants their name to encapsulate racism. I mean, really, these white women were acting as if only their comfort, their ideas, their worldview mattered. Every time I said my name, I felt like I was a traitor to all that I was actively working to dismantle. I began asking people to call me Kay, shortened version of my name, thought it might be easy. I had a tagline to my email, always very important, those taglines, explaining that I stand in solidarity with people. Yes, we have to call this out. We need to make sure that people know that this behavior is abhorrent and it must be stopped. And sometimes being able to name something is the first step to being able to actually eradicate it. If I can claim something with a word, then I can see it and I can be in the process of saying no. I added a link to an Atlantic, I added a link to an Atlantic article explaining why Karen was the name. I changed my Google, Twitter, Zoom, address labels, it was all there. I felt awkward at first asking people to call me Kay, but it seemed like a small price for all of us to be able to name something in order to eradicate those actions. Eventually, I had had most of the necessary conversations, and there I was standing on the right side of history. I mean, it even felt a little smug. Yep, here I am doing my heart. Yes, that is me showing up. Thank you very much. Lord, help me when I think I know the right thing to do. Help me not to be arrogant in my ignorance. Now that is a dangerous prayer. In a five-day national community organizing class, that prayer was answered. I got called out. First day, online Zoom, we were introducing ourselves, a trainer, black woman asked me, Kay, why Kay? And I told her the story, probably a little pride sticking out, and they said something like, really? Do you think changing your name removes the privilege and experience that goes along with that name? Do you think changing your name makes you less white? Do you think changing your name changes your history? You have lived in the world with that name and it fits as far as I can tell. I was stunned and some part of me knew she was right. I changed my name. 
I was running away from the discomfort of my cultural history. I was brought up in America in the 1960s, brought up with images of people of color in sitcoms that told me they were poor and that was funny. I was brought up in a high school where my black friend was forbidden from dating a white girl. I was brought up with news covering tragedies in neighborhoods as if they were foreign countries, brought up with images and words and stories and products that all said, you are different, even as a Unitarian Universalist. Karen is my name for a reason. And I realize now that my discomfort was really calling attention to my internalized racism. The author and activist Glennon Doyle reminds me, every white person who shows up is going to have her racism called out. She will have to accept that others will disagree with how she's showing up and that they will have every right to disagree. She will need to learn to withstand people's anger knowing that much of it is real and true and necessary. She will need to accept that one of the privileges that she's letting burn is my, is her emotional comfort. She will need to remind herself that being called racist is not actually the worst thing. The worst thing is privately hiding racism to stay safe and liked and comfortable while others suffer and die. There are worse things than being criticized, like being a coward. The lizard in the tree Mooney clan, the colonizing Bradfords, the obnoxious Karens. All of these stories point to the fullness of who I am in this world right now. I can story my life with partial truths, but that would leave me unable to accept and love my complicated, broken, creative, joy-filled, and often conflicted self. And if I can't accept myself, how can I begin to welcome your complicated, creative, broken, and conflicted selves? You see, if we only tell pretty stories, if we never find the ground of truth where roots can hold the fullness of life, we will never make it. I choose the path where the stories I tell point me towards my humanity, the fullness of it, reminding me to pay attention to the discomfort that I might feel. That discomfort is a pointer to where there's a seed of something in me that needs to be examined. Thank the Lord. We must work to understand our stories, to tell the full and nuanced versions, to accept the uncomfortable histories along with the inspired or outrageous. From the ground of truth, my friends, from the ground of truth, we actually have the ability to live with compassion and curiosity about ourselves and about each other. certain that your words of service say that there was going to be something else here. Um, so this is a song called Humble and Kind by Lori McKenna. No Get the keys under the mat when your childhood star shines. Always stay humble and kind. Go to church cause your mama says to visit grandpa any chance that you can. 
Don't take for granted the love this life gives you. Get where you're going, turn yourself back around. Oh, help the next one in line. Always stay humble and kind. Books. Books. When I think about Babs, my, our, our grandmother, I think of books. Books in her apartment, books she gave me, books from the library, books she suggested I read. Her first gift to me, Rachel Carson, A Sense of Wonder. A picture book with grown up words. The Secret Garden, A Sense of Wonder, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, Half Magic, books she'd enjoyed as a child. She loved books, words, poems, and essays, and we bonded over that shared love. She told me that memorizing words, poems, and short stories was a way to carry them with you always and have them available to share with others. So I learned to memorize the poems I loved. This book, <laughs> this book represents Babs to me. Babs, Margaret Sharp, grew up in society in St. Louis. She learned the importance of looking right and acting the right way when she was young. She went to the hairdresser. She had ball gowns and summer frocks, necklaces and earrings to match every outfit. Her involvement and appearance in affairs was noted in society pages. She married Ralph Mooney, the one saved from the, uh, from the uh, snake, who was also well-to-do. Then in the depression, they lost their wealth through poor investments, loss of rents and inability to pay taxes on the land they owned. 
Luckily, Ralph worked for AT&T AT &T, and the phone company just kept going. So they had a roof over their heads and they had food on the table, but not enough for the gowns and jewels, the maids and the cooks that Babs had grown up with. This book is the joy of cooking. You probably know it, it's in its ninth edition now. This one is second edition printed in 1936. At about that time, Bob Babs would have been figuring out how to keep and run a household. The Joy of Cooking was a godsend to a generation of young women who now had to run households but hadn't grown up helping in the kitchen. With simple recipes, easy to understand instructions and menu plans for everything from elaborate parties to caring for an invalid, the book helped women prepare family meals. Yet notice that this book doesn't have the standard gray-blue cover. Babs worked as a librarian, and when the original cover became torn, decided to have the book recovered. Instead of covering it in the similar color, she decided to match the bright orange color of her pots and pans. She wanted it to match her kitchen. She was always thinking about appearances. So what did I learn from Babs? I learned to treasure words. I learned that reading something I thought could be boring could actually be very engaging and instructive. I learned the skill of memorization and the comfort of carrying memorized poems, <laughs> memorized poems and songs with me. What didn't I learn from Babs? I didn't learn to attach too much appearance to too much importance to appearances, much to Babs' chagrin. This was in large part due to what I had learned from my mother. Our mom, Janet Bump Mooney, was very practical with an adventurous side as well. Perhaps like all parents, she enjoyed doing embarrassing things, at least in the eyes of her children. Things like dancing in the grocery store aisle to the music playing on the store. This popover tin is what represents her to me. Her mother was a fabulous cook, and mom had been cooking since a child. She enjoyed trying new recipes and foods with mixed success. We all enjoyed the large, round, whole grain bread from the day old bread store covered in vegetables and cheese and broiled in the oven. The time she brought kidneys home, however, met with universal, dis universal disfavor and was not attempted again. The smelt, small Lake Michigan fish, when they were running, she would buy them for pennies to the pound, and we'd put up with chopping off the small fish heads and eating the rest, even though it wasn't our favorite. But we balked completely at even trying to chop the head off a snapping turtle found walking down our small road so mom could try turtle soup. Instead, we made sure it got into the woods where it was probably going to lay her eggs. I'm still not sure if mom was serious about that or just joking with us. Her spiritual beliefs were practical as well. We attended Unitarian Universalist churches growing up. Dad was an atheist. He saw no reason to believe in a God. Mom was agnostic. While she didn't express belief in a specific deity, she argued that you can't really know if there is or isn't some higher power while you're alive on earth. Just as it can't be proven, it can't really be disproven either. Since she couldn't know what happens before birth or after death, she focused on this life. She believed that we make our own heaven and hell in this world. We should spend our time making this world better, helping our neighbors, feeding the hungry, taking care of our planet, instead of focusing on the next world. That we should live simply taking advantage of the bounty the world offers. That we should reuse, recycle, reduce, compost, leaving space for others, be they human, animal, or plant. That we should consider the impact on our ecosystem and strive for balance. That we should respect, honor, and learn from people of all different walks of life, ethnicities, genders, and religion. No one person has all the answers, but together, perhaps we do. 
At the same time, she was open to the unexpected and enjoyed adventures when they occurred. She didn't question and wasn't afraid of the consequences, the unexplainable when it happened in life. What did I learn from mom? Live for today, live it for this world, for this life, with all the beauty and struggle, all the joy and pain, all the richness and simplicity it has to offer. But this is the only world we can be sure of having. And at the same time, keep the door open for that mystery, for the unexplained and unexpected that may come as well. Please stand in body or spirit to sing hymn number 108, My Life Flows On. The words are in the gray hymnal, or hopefully on your screen. your hands or your heart or clasp hands with those you are sharing your life with during these times and hear these words of benediction. Thomas King says, you have to be careful with the stories you tell. You have to watch out for the stories that you are told because stories are all that we are. Be curious, my friends and lean into the stories that breathe you into being. Be curious and look at those around you and wonder who they might be and what stories they have to tell you. Amen and blessed be.